I came out about um, smoking the occasional joint just the other week in the age, and it was a really remarkable response. Uh, Neil Mitchell uh, interviewed me, and I've been trying to get on Neil Mitchell's show for the whole election campaign. Um, so smoke, telling, telling the world, telling the state that I'd smoked a joint and I was running for parliament um, did the trick. <laughs> but um, he then went on to chastise me for um, normalising drugs um, and then all, encouraging all his listeners to watch, and I haven't seen it, three grannies smoking a bong. Um, <laughs> apparently his son really liked that. Uh, but today I'm not going to talk about that, I'm going to talk about the bastard of that, which is social tonics. Um, and this, the, the products that I'll be, I guess, going talking about today is more the products that are there to mimic the effects of, of cannabis. All people buy them for that purpose. Um, they emerged in about 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008 in Australia. And it was a, sorry, I'm just, I feel weird having things in my mouth. No, actually, that's not true. <laughs> I feel quite uncomfortable with that, actually. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so I've, I've been an industry lobbyist and mainly just lobbying around sex. So it was interesting hearing Steph and Dave talk about the links between sex and drugs. Um, so my industry had been selling X-rated films for many years, but as this thing called the internet came to pass, um, they started to look at other areas. So we moved to fireworks in the ACT. We were selling millions of dollars worth of fireworks, which seemed quite appropriate for sex shops as well. Um, erectile dysfunction products, uh, and then we started looking at these new, uh, new emerging psychoactive substances. Um, and around 2007, 2008, they started to be sold in adult stores and tobacconists. So in 2011, the laws began. Now, I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, it's not, I don't know, I don't know why I thought that the Mining Council wouldn't be the leader in drug reform, as in drug prohibition. But it was really, these laws were pushed forward by mining councils, um, departments of fair trading, um, mental health ministers. It just seemed to me it wasn't the usual suspects for, um, for drug prohibition. And I, I just pulled out the New South Wales Minerals Council's um, logic on banning these substances. Because their logic was, if they were banned, we'd be able to deal with them more easily, like we deal with alcohol. <laughs> okay. Where do we start with that? Um, but so, since that time, then they, the, the substances just kept coming. Um, the, the reports are that we, we develop a new substance every week, every five days, and in the last few years, over 300 new substances have, um, have emerged onto the market. And I think this is really showing, for me, it's starting to show the breakdown in um, the prohibition model. Um, for me, that is, um, for most of the legislators, they haven't learned that yet. So they've now introduced over 40 new legislative amendments. Um, we just had a new one come through the other week um, that um, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but over 40 of them. Now, they haven't actually been very successful. They've tried a whole range of things, uh, but we've yet to have a conviction in Australia, even though we've had different laws all over the place. Um, so, there's, there's, they've been tried all these different legislative approaches. So, Fair Trading came up with this really great idea, we're just going to ban products. So they banned Buddha Express, uh, Black Mambo, um, 21 different brand names. And don't tell anyone, but actually everyone just took them out of those packets and put them into new packets with new names. Um, so that didn't actually work. They then tried banning specific substances, so JWH, 018 and different chemical substances were then prohibited. And with new substances coming out every month or every week, 
uh, basically they just, the, the manufacturers just shifted to another substance. Um, and this cat and mouse system has been going on for years and still goes on today. Then they decided, all right, let's try analogue. So we won't say, we can't say if it's JWH, we'll say if it's like JWH018. So they tried this notion of analogues. And um, they got very enthusiastic about this. In fact, in Queensland, they decided to ban this incredibly broad range of analogues. It was so broad, it's actually, I, I'm sorry to break this to the Queenslanders, but avocados are now illegal in Queensland, um, as are certain cheeses. Uh, of course, you know, the, um, the Attorney General, you know, thought I was being ridiculous stating this because he, he said, you know, in his expert opinion, if it walked like a duck, it was a drug. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, one of the sponsors here, Happy High Herbs, um, uh, came under the attention of the Queensland government at the time, and they were particularly concerned about the Himalayan bath salt that um, Happy Herbs was selling. Because they'd heard, they'd read in the media, bath salts, that's what they call it these days. <laughs> so they seized bucket loads of Himalayan bath salt. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that they did return them. Uh, but so this, this continued. Um, in, in, in Queens, oh sorry, in New South Wales, they did the same thing. Um, and it was sort of, if it, if it had a significant psychoactive effect, then it was illegal. Um, and they then listed a number of substances and also analogues. They actually, and the next speaker, Torsten, may correct me on this, but it, uh, you know, for the sake of a good story, they actually banned a whole bunch of acacia bushes, um, a, partic a rather nice one that was growing in New South Wales parliamentary gardens became an illicit, illegal drug because if boiled and treated in some way or another, it could have a psychoactive effect. Um, down here in Victoria, they did it down here, and they, actually I wrote to the minister because I said, you know that with this broad analogue that you've created, analogue legislation, you've banned tobacco. And, um, and he wrote back to me saying, yes, Fiona, I know. <laughs> Whoa, shit. I, I then read on to the page two. Um, he said, yes, I know, but of course we wouldn't ban tobacco. You know, because this analogue clause in, is intended to capture dangerous drugs. <laughs> and drugs emerging onto the market that are not, less list, are not listed as a drug of dependence. But might be considered a dangerous drug in the future. So of course that wasn't tobacco. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, we've seen uh, 40 different laws. Oh, sorry, just go back. The last law was this reverse onus of proof now. So now in the federal government came up with this brilliant Customs Act that if we don't know what it is, it's illegal. It's fine. Everything's illegal. <laughs> Unless we know what it is. Um, and so this is how they're going to stop these substances from coming into the country because they're illegal now because we don't know what they are. Um, that's actually really worked for the drugs they do know what they are and are illegal as well. Uh, that 10 billion or 11 billion dollar industry of imported illicit drugs, um, they're doing very well there, aren't they? So just looking at some of the numbers that we're talking about with this product, as you can see, we sold in the last 12 months over 12 million units of this product. Uh, and these are sold widely through a wide range of areas. Um, for the most part, people are using them weekly. For the most part, people are using them um, to relax. And they're using them as they would possibly the actual product, cannabis, that that is. And we presented these to the federal government, and in fact, I presented them at a um, committee hearing when they were trying to ban everything that they didn't know what it was, um, and suggested that there was actually quite a lot of income to be made from these products. Uh, imagine if you just taxed them and regulated them. And that really got the attention of Senator MacDonald, the, um, the Liberal 
uh, Liberal Senator on the on the on the on the committee, and we started talking through the possibilities of sixty million dollars being made from these products, as well as being able to list what was in the products, being able to test the products, being able to restrict where they were sold and how they were sold, and we these figures. Um, were compelling, but obviously not compelling enough to, to break the prohibition nexus. But I do think, in an interesting way, these, these products are proving that prohibition just doesn't work. You can't just say we're going to ban Buddha Express. You can't just say we're going to ban JW018. You can't even just say we're going to ban anything that's like JW018. And you even can't say, we're just going to ban anything from coming into the country that we don't know. Um, it's just not working. We also, in looking at these products, we actually went out and talked to the consumers. Or more effectively, we asked the people who were selling the substances to talk to their customers and asked them why they were using these products um, and, and how they were using them. And as you can see, these were the reasons that they were using them. Now we're not saying that they're, you know, that they're all great, and certainly we've had quite, um, we've had, we've had some negative responses uh, from these substances. I myself have tried them and tried one or two of them, and um, you know, was pretty pleased when they wore off. Um, <laughs> not that I wouldn't do it again. Uh, they, they, you know, they do have their risks, but what obviously would be the safer thing, and as, as Steph and Dave were talking about, as Andrew has talked about, if we actually knew what was in them and we could provide information about dosages and about how to take them more safely. So in trying to look after this um, industry, which is worth hundreds of millions of dollars in this country, uh, the industry itself tried to develop some form of self-regulation because we couldn't get the government to do it. So we introduced a kind of a, we introduced what we called a hologram system. Now, unfortunately, this wasn't necessarily there to protect the consumer, as much as that's what we would have liked to have done, and as much as that's what our retailers would like to do. We couldn't do that because of the way the laws are, are placed. I mean, if we said it had a psychoactive effect, even if it didn't, it would be illegal in Queensland and New South Wales and a number of other states. So what we could do is we could get chem chemical reports about the, sub about the products. So we, we knew what was in the product. And we could test, we could look at that from a legal perspective as to see whether that product was actually legal to sell. And then we would issue a hologram sticker to that. We spoke to the police about this. Um, particularly on the grounds of recall. So if someone did have a negative or an adverse reaction to a product, and we did have this situation last year where five people were hospitalised after using one of these products, um, it was probably polydrug use that was the, the actual reason for this, but we were able to recall that product within hours because we knew what number stickers it had, we knew exactly what the substance was, and we recalled it within hours. Um, at the time. So we've distributed about one million stickers. Most of the major companies in this area are, are using the sticker system. It enables us to regulate it, it enables them to regulate it. So when the WA government comes out and bans another substance, they can pull it off the shelf quickly. We present this to, to the, um, the police and we've had quite a good response from police that when they see the hologram sticker, they just leave that product alone. Unfortunately, this doesn't allow, enable us to talk about dosages. Um, what's, we can't tell the user, what's, the customer, what's in it, but at least it starts to help us in this area. And I'm pretty sure it's probably the first time that we've seen psychoactive substances of this ilk um, being stickered and regulated and registered at, at, at any level. Um, this afternoon, you'll hear from Grant Hall, who will talk about um, the, the, the movement and the legislation that they introduced into, into New Zealand, which was particularly very good. But anyway, I'm kind of the constant optimist, which is why I run for Parliament, um, which is why I probably made two promises that if I got elected, I would um, first I'd introduce a bill on voluntary euthanasia, 
And second, I'd probably smoke a bong on 420. Um, <laughs> after work hours, of course, because you may have heard they're going to bring in drug testing for politicians. Um, <laughs> sure, actually, if they were on drugs, they'd be far more interesting. Um, this, um, I think, really kind of, for me, this really, uh, you know, encapsulates this war on drugs that we keep this war on drugs um, and the drug dealers uh, get richer. And in my own industry that's working in a kind of grey legal industry is turning over well over $700 million a year selling a product that mimicked cannabis. And, you know, I, I speak to hundreds of, well, uh, yeah, probably hundreds of politicians about this. And, of course, I finish it with, um, well, of course, if we legalised cannabis, I wouldn't be here, nor would any of these products. Um, and um, they nod and shoo me out the door. But that is absolutely what the Australian Sex Party is trying to do. In fact, many of the people that we spoke to in the campaign leading up to this were quite disappointed with our policies because there just wasn't enough sex in them. Uh, but we do have it, this is just a smattering of some of our drug legislation and I'm hopeful that um, if we are successful, that we can take the debate that step further. And I mean, talks like this are fantastic for us talking to ourselves and, I, and about where we need to go with, with drug law reform. But I'm hoping that just having a voice in parliament that says, all right, we will legalise medicinal marijuana, and I think that will, obviously, most of you would be aware, that will happen very soon in this country. But the biggest complaint is that people, oh my God, they might use it recreationally. Um, so my solution to that is legalise the recreational use. Um, I, I, I do hope to, um, to hopefully that maybe this wonderful state of Victoria might be the first one to, to start moving down that path. Um, as I say, I am a, an incredible optimist. Uh, we'd, I would also like to bring in, um, I would also like to bring in the availability of, of, of pill testing kits. Um, during our campaign, we actually handed out happy pills at Parliament, uh, sorry, at Parliament Station and a whole bunch of train stations. I was actually, I was the lucky one. I got to go to Broadmeadows train station and stand in the tunnel and hand out pills. Um, <laughs> remarkable how many people take them, you know. <laughs> oh really? Fantastic, thanks, you know. <laughs> um, what's in them? They ask as they're wandering up, putting it in their mouth, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were just breath fresheners, but uh, we did call them happy pills. Uh, but yes, I, 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 I would hope that um, if the Australian Sex Party is successful, that we can be a loud voice for drug law reform. Um, it's so encouraging seeing what's happening overseas, seeing what's happening in Colorado and numerous other states um, in the US. In fact, it's kind of embarrassing. We always think that they're kind of like the, you know, the conservative old uncle. And look at them, you know, they're doing amazing things. Gay marriage, drug law reform a whole thing, so, but they don't have a sex party. Um, so I'm hoping that, that, um, that we can be successful and set up a cannabis industry in Australia, both medical, recreational and industrial, as well as I would like to see the personal possession and use of all drugs decriminalised um, and treated from a health perspective rather than a law perspective. Um, We've seen this in places like Portugal and the, the outcomes are very positive. Anyway, thank you. Hey, I'm Isaac, um, I'm 20 and I've just finished my Certificate 3 of Horticulture. And in the next few years, I plan on moving into like a study on plants at the level of like tissue culture and genetic fusions to create new strains of marijuana and, you know, utilising it for medic medicinal purposes. So Fantastic. Do you think I'd have a job in that industry in Australia in the next 10 years, say? 
Well, I seriously do hope so. Um, I, I guess people might have seen that there was an IPO, which is a, a float for the stock exchange from a company um, just last week uh, to um, investigate and research medicinal cannabis in Australia, even though it's still illegal. But I would be very hopeful that in the next few years, we won't have to send you over to Colorado or over to Canada or over to Israel, um, that you would, have, you would have a great job here. Um, it, it will happen, and I think there's a medicinal bill in federal parliament, David, is that? Medicinal bill in federal parliament. ACT will have one up shortly. New South Wales and Victoria. Um, all varyingly timid in their approach, but I hope that we'll be cultivating in Aust Victoria and buying your stuff soon. So I'm wondering, in terms of decriminalisation and eventual legalisation in Australia, do you think that that could happen happen independently at a state level or is it eventually going to have to happen at a federal level? So could, could individual states pull away and make radical changes on their own or, or not? Uh, well, yes, they can, um, with the exception of the ACT in the Northern Territory that have constitutional connections to federal legislation. Uh, but states, states can do it. Um, and, you know, they, they quite often they will list um, UN conventions as the reason that they can't. Um, but states can do it. Import is obviously still difficult because that's still a federal matter. But setting up um, a, a, a can medical cannabis industry in Victoria would be entirely legal without federal help. My name is Vinny Ruda. I'm a Brazilian citizen. I've been here in Melbourne for two years now. And I was living in college for my first year. And after three or four days of drinking goon and uh, <laughs> drinking a lot of alcohol and getting accustomed to the Australian custom. Um, I know I, everyone thinks that Vegemite's <laughs> our thing of choice. It's actually goon. Yeah, well, yeah. I looked around and I asked one of my mates and I said, well, is someone going to smoke a joint at some point? And they looked at me holding a goon sack and told me, well, we don't do drugs. And I wanted to ask you, what kind of mentality do you see that playing on children, especially, mm -hmm. and how can we uh, kind of uh, bring education to, to kids and to families still, because there's a lot of people who really treat alcohol as a, a, a normal substance and everything else That's as right. a drug. You know, it, one, I know of, of Nick Wallace, who works in my office, he's like constantly screaming every time he reads this letter from the pre preview to one of the drug reports by this government that says alcohol ab abuse and drug use. Right. Uh, so it's all right to use alcohol as long as you don't abuse it. But yeah, I mean, all of the st statistics, everyone acknowledges that alcohol is far more dangerous um, and causes uh, far more harm than pretty much all other drugs put together. Um, but I think we are starting to see a kind of change in that, that a lot of organisations are alcohol and drugs. Um, I would think it could, we should maybe just say drugs, and that includes alcohol, uh, but we can work towards that, I think. Just uh, a comment in relation to the Australian industry uh, with reference to the New Zealand experience. In New Zealand, the legislation over there put the onus on the industry to actually develop products which were tested prior to introduction mm. into the marketplace because although there, I think there were some products that were actually okay in terms of the synthetic cannabis products, uh, there were also many that were actually quite problematic and there was a level of harm that was experienced in New Zealand and I think we need to acknowledge that. Yes. Is there an initiative on the behalf of the Australian industry to develop products and test products prior to putting them into the marketplace? You know, that, that is happening. It's not happening in the regulated way that, that the legislation enabled it, the industry to work with in, in New Zealand, or will, hopefully. Um, it is done at um, a, a sort of, yeah, it's done, to a, it's done to a certain level within the industry. We haven't developed, we haven't been able to develop protocols, but most people have. And, I mean, it's, it's a constant problem that we're finding within an industry that operates in such a grey market that... Some of the larger producers and manufacturers and the ones that, that the industry association deals with are the responsible ones. And they say, right, we want a product that will affect people in this way, but will not find them having adverse effects or um, particularly things like, you know, kidney failure. Uh, mm -hmm. However, sometimes you find that 
you get then a sort of a, 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 a race to the bottom where everyone goes, no, I'm going to do one that's even stronger than that. You know, I'm doing Buddha Express, super duper, extra, extra. Um, and we, we've been try we try and work with the industry to stop that. But really, it, it, we need, it would be great to see something like New Zealand, you know. Hopefully New Zealand comes up with this fantastic um, regulation that works brilliantly and then New Zealand will adopt us and we'll all live as a happy family. Yeah, well, and unfortunately, I think there's a bit of a roadblock there, which uh, was probably referenced by, uh, say, Andrew initially, uh, in terms of the denial, uh, you know, to actually engage with that legislation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Just Jeff. one uh, further point there, which um, maybe mm. Grant might cover a little later in the day, is that, um, as I understand it, Jeff, the, um, uh, the New Zealand model was not prepared to decriminalise previously criminalised compounds, so they had to be novel psychoactive substances. How do you feel about the concept of decriminalising um, plant-based drugs that have thousands of years of, of harmless human use, uh, and whether that could be something that we could um, move towards as, a, as an enhancement, perhaps, of the New Zealand model? I would love that. I mean, and certainly, I mean, I know that Jeff and, and a lot of the, the um, campaigners over in New Zealand obviously were saying you know, we wouldn't need this new psychoactive substances legislation if we just legalised the old psychoactive substances. Um, I, I certainly think that um, that is a far safer and more sensible approach would be, um, yeah, legalising plant material rather than plant material with something sprayed on it and then dipped in acetone or whatever happens, <laughs> yeah. I think these are all like really great things to advocate, like decriminalization and um, of like cannabis and mm. other drugs. And I think you know there's so much uh, litany of scientific and anecdotal research on how these substances can be used responsibly and safely. But when it comes mm. to the new social tonics, like these kind of substances like JWH and Black Buddha or yeah. whatever, they're coming out every week, and there's not a lot of research on the safety and as well as that you can't advocate or you can't tell your consumers how they're used or in dosages mm -hmm. as well as the fact that the kind of ways to do harm minimization with them and responsibly use them aren't known because they're so novel how can you kind of ethically justify selling substances like that when the risks aren't known and communicated to consumers because they're doing it and because they're being developed um, it's sort of how can you sell ice because people want it um, it's there. I think we are trying to minimise some of that harm in, in some ways, but I agree, you know, the, but there is a high demand for it. Um, you know, at some ways, if we can try and um, educate the industry and set protocols and um, develop codes of practice around um, the supply of these products, that's at least a bit safer than um, not having them. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. I mean, that we don't know what these products are. There's very little research on them. And we don't know long-term effects either. Uh, but they're on the market. There's a new one coming out every five days. And we could just say no. But I think most people would realise that that's not working. My name's Ben, and I'm, I'm kind of curious on... Uh, federal persecution. So it, within state politics uh, around the world, let's take uh, California, for example, where in 2007 they had 367 uh, dispensaries, but then huge amounts of them were being shut down by federal government. Is there a way for a state government or a state system to safeguard themselves against uh, federal persecution? Um, the Australian Constitution is slightly different to the American Constitution and our federal drug laws, um, our, our state drug laws can a act quite separate to our federal laws, um, except on things like import. Yeah. Uh, but yes, a state can introduce their own legalisation or decriminalisation while the feds might still um, criminalise that product, so it is possible, and we don't. The feds don't have the same um, overriding power on on drugs as they do in the United States. It's a slightly different legislation. P.S. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Thanks very much for a fantastic Thanks, talk. Martin.